It's the tiny things that count. Be it something good or something bad, an experience can be wonderful. But if one small thing is off, it's usually the only thing that I can personally think about all day. This is, to put it gently, annoying to most people. I'm totally one of those guys who, while watching the trailer for new movies, will say everything looks like a protein excretion because it is. Have you looked around lately? <laughs> Rome is collapsing, man. Time to pack a camel and hump it out of civilization because this shit's going down. Like if I'm getting into the stock market, it's probably a really good time for you to sell all your stock. I hate being that way. Like, you know, it actually takes conscious effort on my part to be nice. Like, if my kid does really good on a test, I have to force a smile so I don't end up saying something stupid like, a 94% on spelling isn't English the language that you speak? Are you satisfied with that? It's exhausting being the only person in the room who can't enjoy a movie about Channing Tatum's abs. Or Channing Tatum's abs on a flying boogie board. Anyway, it's the tiny things like I was saying. Like in game design, for example. Everything can be going great. You're decapitating people, pulling off headshots, doing all kinds of acrobatics. And then a guy pulls a gun out of his head and tries to slot it into yours. That little thing, when weighed against the entirety of the experience, seems like such a small part of the game. But it'll be the one thing you remember for weeks. Not those wicked headshots, or decapitating people in the middle of a billiard room. You're gonna remember that bug. Because it's the small annoyances that make you forget the good. And that's true for relationships as much as it is in design. Sometimes it's just a gameplay mechanic you don't like. For example, you might be the type that likes JRPGs, but you hate the combat. You're willing to put up with it, but the experience is somewhat tarnished. But lately I've been seeing a trend in gaming, and it's one that I fully support. See, designers are a lot like parents. They don't want to hear that one of their children might be a little ugly. But a few of those parents have been taking their kids to the dentist. This trend for me started when Pillars of Eternity 2 added a turn-based mode to their game, even after it had been out on the market for a while at that point. I had no interest in playing that game previously. But when I ran across the patch description on Steam and saw that they added turn-based, well, I just needed to check it out for myself. And I'm glad I did, because I had a lot of fun experiences with that game. So much so that I never much felt the need to go back and experience the game the way the developers originally intended it to be experienced. This felt like the right game designed in the right way for me, and I couldn't see myself playing it any other way. And look, I know that there are people who like the old school feeling of real time with pause. That's fine. You can like old things. I'm not judging you. But another company has pulled a George Lucas and changed their game posthumously. Alcat Games to be specific. They added turn-based combat to Pathfinder Kingmaker, which I am honestly thankful for. But it brought up a question. What can be improved about real time with pause to keep the feeling of it, but leave out the busy work and complications that seem implicit with each and every real time with pause game out there? Well, let's dig in, shall we? There's an obvious improvement to real time that not many developers in mainstream CRPG experiences are even considering, and that's the concept of action cues. Think tyranny and how you could queue up multiple actions back to back, but add in movement as one of those actions. An even better example of this can be found in the earlier Rainbow Six games. How this works is you select a character and queue up to three or four rounds worth of actions, like for example, having a cast or cast expeditious retreat, then have them walk to a struggling character and cast a heal spell, then retreat to a flanking position and cast a fireball on the enemy's back line. The character doesn't carry out these commands until the game is unpaused. Once unpaused, you watch your character carry out these commands in the order you designed. There's something inherently interesting about setting up a complex plan than watching it get carried out by your characters. Sometimes these plans go well and you get the dopamine hit from the success, but even in failure, the player can see in real time where the plan went wrong and make adjustments. There's a couple of changes from the formula of real time we need to address aside from the obvious changes to action cues. First, the change to movement actions needs to happen. In my system, the player would be drawing a route on the screen and that path can be as complex as the player wants it to be, and at the end caps of these routes, an action can be queued up. Then another move can be made, another action can be queued up, and before you know it, the player has four rounds worth of actions queued up. This would require a new skill for the player to learn, the ability to read the actions of the enemy. Some players would pick up on this and learn innovative ways to game the AI, and others might ignore it entirely, but the majority of people I believe would use this system like this to do something the current system should already do, which is to allow the player to move a character and then have the character target an enemy at range with an action at the end of the route. Basically, the player is dropping waypoints on the map and projectiles are being aimed from the waypoint, not from where the character is currently standing. The way these systems are designed now is that you could choose to move to an enemy and attack, but only with melee. With any other action, you need to pick a place for the character to move, then wait for them to get there, heal your character that just got critted, 
Send the thief to the back line, then oops, I forgot about my spellcaster. She's just been standing there, firing arrows at whoever she pleases. Root dependent actions essentially eliminate a lot of this frustration. This system eliminates a good chunk of the babysitting associated with real time with pause games as well. It's what I think turns off a lot of new players. Imagine how good it would feel to have your spellcaster cast an AoE debuff and immediately, without your further input, took the next round to cast a spell the enemy's weak to, then followed it up by retreating back just in case their actions drew aggro. All of that is happening without you, the player, having to do anything but watch it go down, and cackle in joy as their genius plan unfolds. It's a bit of a paradigm shift to be sure, but it's one that I would love to see. Because tabletop RPGs have their roots in wargaming, so it only makes sense to take a more tactical approach to combat. You could take it even further with macro systems just like the one found in Final Fantasy XII. The Gambit system was one of my favorite aspects of the game because it felt like I was not just programming their actions, but in a way, I was programming their personalities in combat. It's a layer of customization I feel is often left out of the conversation when these games are designed. For those that don't know, or have never played the game, the Gambit system allows you to program behavior for each AI teammate. Like, if PC HP is less than 25%, heal. Or if teammate is afflicted with silence, use item. The great thing this system did was open up options later, which made the system feel like an extension of loot, and instead of getting a better sword, you get better artificial intelligence. That game really doesn't get enough credit for this innovation. The other thing that it did was get rid of the busy work that previous Final Fantasy titles were famous for. Why not leverage this power in a CRPG? In real-time combat, there's this thing that tends to happen that I call bunching. See, your formations for your party are fairly simple and small and take up only a portion of the screen. So if an enemy sees you from across a large open area, no matter who in your party they're attacking, if both parties start advancing to one another, they'll eventually converge to a single point, attacking whoever is in range. Since their likely target, the tank, is usually at the front of the pack, they'll all converge on that point and attack the same target, even putting their backs out there for obvious sneak attacks. This behavior doesn't make sense logically, because while ganging up can be a benefit, the most effective tactic is almost always to engage the tank, then have the off tank go around to the back line. This is likely a limitation in AI's behavior. The result is that a lot of melee combat ends up feeling like the same thing over and over again. Like your tank is a magnet and every enemy is a piece of metal. Essentially, CRPG real time with pause ends up feeling a lot like football, where all the melee characters sit in a pile up at the line of scrimmage while the thief and range characters take out the back lines, or it becomes a free for all circle jerk where the enemy gangs up on one character while the damage dealers pick them off. It often leads to predictable scenarios, but then there's times when the scrimmage gobbles up your entire party while a mage nukes the area with controlled fireballs. It almost always becomes a situation where this large group limits what your mages are capable of doing. For instance, no fireballs, no lightning, none of the heavy guns used which is like cutting off a mage's limb. You can make it work, sure, but it feels like everything is just a little more tedious. Basically, one of the major issues I have with real time is that every fight tends to play out in the same way. One person gets ganged up on while the rest of the team just tries to hold things together by chipping away at the big boys. Rarely does the combat turn the tables in an interesting way. I want to make a suggestion that should make this sort of thing go away. There's the easy way, which is to spread out enemies, don't have them bunched up into groups, have some enemies in the room patrolling. That way there's always one threat out there that can be approaching the party from any direction. Wandering monsters are really good at taking a fight from boring to panic mode, for instance, especially when they enter the battle from behind your party. A more elegant solution might be to have some specific movement behavior for certain enemy types. For instance, instead of engaging a tank, a thief might cast Expeditious Retreat and try to take the long way around. Maybe on his way he jukes the knight in full plate stomping after him, easily getting around the blocker and sacking the quarterback, so to speak. The player should also have a lot more control over how a melee character who's currently engaged in combat can move around. For instance, a lot of real-time games have the PCs circle each other in random directions. But wouldn't it be nice to be able to tell them to take that half step back, or to the direction you want to inch your way towards? This would make the melee fighting much more engaging, as where it stands now, melee fighting is fairly set and forget until later levels, or depending on your build. Also, the enemy should make use of acrobatics to disengage safely. Safely, but with a notification that they've done so somewhere in a game space. This would cause a need for the back line to be mobile. Expeditious Retreat would become even more powerful in those scenarios where the mages are now running for their lives while the front line tries to hold the ranks. 
You could treat formations as a set of commands as well. So if you want a certain character to do a certain thing whenever battle starts, the formation could act as macros where the thief seeks out the closest route to a ranged caster class, while the tanks go out and engage in groups. These formations are essentially football formations where a character is running a route to a point, then its next action is to look for an open backstab or attack the nearest ranged character. Formation tactics in a real-time tactical game could be an interesting way to set your real time with pause concept into something that stands out among the crowd, and you can safely pull inspiration from football. Seriously, I'm not going to let that football analogy go because it works so well. Football is essentially small-scale warfare, a simulation of foot soldiers and archers. It's a perfect place to pull inspiration from. Another solution could be to make feats for combat maneuvers that are actually passive into active things that you have to activate and allow those to be formations in real time. You keep the passive bonus for turn base, but you obviously wouldn't be able to make more than one person move at the same time. But just imagine how much more interesting real time would be if you could do things like actual shield walls that help mitigate arrow accuracy and actually have a real time component that messages what is actually happening on the battlefield. There's something strange about the pathfinding in Pathfinder. Wonky pathfinding is actually a well worn trope in real time with pause games. In fact, some would call it a feature and a glitch when it works against them. Let's talk about how this issue can be mitigated through some simple changes to the real time system. This happens a lot in real time, where the space to move is cut off by companions who have chosen to bunch up around an enemy. But even though the space is still too tight, the pathfinding will sometimes direct you to a path that has no hope of completing, wasting your movement. This happens because the pathfinding forces the person moving to get as close to the enemy as they can in the most movement efficient way possible. Now, this causes a lot of problems like you see here where I should be able to step over these bodies. But I can't, because my companions have created a narrow wedge of space for me to move through with their collision meshes. And because my collision mesh is bigger than the space, I can't move through it. Now there's a couple of ways to handle this. First way is to make it so companions always leave enough space for other companions to move. Because being bunched up like this seems like I should be taking a hit to my accuracy since I can't really comfortably swing my weapon without hitting those next to me. Spacing it out correctly, however, would cause issues where players are forced to use up a standard action to flank an enemy more often than they would like to normally. A large amount of these problems could be fixed with a grid system, like a true 5 meter grid system like in tabletop or Wasteland 3, but barring that, we could find another solution. We can leverage a stat for these types of tight space movements, like combat maneuver or mobility checks to see if you could squeeze through your companions without hindering your action. Let's say that you're just a single movement point away from an enemy, but because the space for you to travel is too narrow, you can't quite reach them. How about allowing the player to use a combat maneuver check or a mobility check to stretch out to attack at a distance? A double confirmation to hit, essentially. This might fix a lot of pathfinding issues and make mobility a much more important stat because of the reach advantage you can get from it. Then, as a result of this, Players might be much more careful about letting companions bunch up. I think it is also in line with what I would allow as a DM, so it doesn't seem too far off from the core rulebook. But like with anything, if you're not informing your players in an obvious way that they're not in the best position, then you're leaving the player to wonder why they keep dying. Messaging is key. Combat feels more intentional and turn-based. In turn-based, you decide where the NPC moves and stops, whereas in real-time, the AI determines where the NPC moves while you suggest a general direction. In turn-based, the line is drawn from the start of your move to the end, and it highlights in red any part of that route that will trigger an attack of opportunity. In real-time, both characters would be moving toward one another until they got to melee range. This means that when the rest of the melee enemies close to engage, they will be much closer to your back line, because the distance that you had to travel to get to the enemy was halved, which might mean that your casters get targeted instead of your tank, which can cause a lot of chaos. This is one of the many ways in which turn-based combat fixes a frustration while also making the combat a bit easier, which, depending on what side of the argument you lie on, could be a good or a bad thing. In turn-based, whoever wins initiative decides the flow of battle, so it becomes easier to guard your ranged and your spellcasters if your initiative is high. The AI. Boy, the AI in real time with pause games, it's bad. If you leave the AI on and aren't babysitting everyone, 
they will often break engagements and get AO'd, and worse than that, if their pathfinding decides to bury the weasel, they will often find themselves breaking engagements over and over again, in a loop, which causes them to constantly get AO'd and killed quicker than you can react. This pretty much never happens in turn base because you can see in the line drawn on the screen where the attack of opportunities came from. So you can wind your way around an enemy safely without risk. A lot of games make it so you get locked into an engagement instead of allowing an NPC to get AOO'd. Like I'm pretty sure Pillars of Eternity had the same system. This is one of those little things that actually makes their real time and real time systems work. If Pathfinder didn't trigger an AOO every time the AI bushwhacked the pathfinding and instead locked you into the engagement and forced you to reassign movement when the player is voluntarily opening themselves up for an AOO, this would fix an annoyance in a system that is otherwise identical to Pillars of Eternity. This type of design is superior to the auto-pause feature for triggering AOOs because you never know what the game is actually pausing for. It doesn't show you on the screen, and seeing your character stop to attack an enemy they weren't told to attack is a sure way to message to the player that an AOO forced an engagement. Turn-based not only eliminates that frustration, but allows you to turn AOO to your advantage without getting booty juked yourself. I'm usually one of those guys that either has to be 100% for something or 100% against it. All in on every bet, and that's why I'm always broke. You know what I mean? So in an effort to stop being that guy, let's talk about the advantages of real time without being snarky. So real time with pause's most obvious benefit is speed. Like no duke, cause yeah, your characters go out, they do their thing, and for trash mobs this is fine because you don't really need to babysit if you keep your low AC characters in the back line. But sometimes, especially in the beginning, keeping them from running in and dying can require you to babysit them without AI on until you optimize their equipment. Because they're always trying to run in and die. Like in real time with pause games, I like to keep my low AC members at range. So if they're not hucking spells or healing, they're usually hitting someone with a crossbow or a sling. Once the front line is well defended or buffed, there's not usually much to worry about. At least for a good chunk of the adventure. Queuing up multiple actions in a single round and then watching everything play out, only to pause it again to observe the result would be amazing. The game would become much more of a management game where you suggest where the NPCs go and if they get there unmolested, that's great. Overall, I think real time with pause can be made into a great system again, but development of it is stymied. Developers who make these niche games have seemingly become satisfied with the chunk of audience they carved out, but I think real time with pause can be amazing, just like it was when it was introduced back in 1998. Ironically, that was the first and last time it was ever developed as a system and games have been using it as is out of the box brand new without any significant changes since that needs to change let's make real time with pause live up to its potential